Hello and welcome to the first dev video for Starship Simulator, our upcoming title where you get to live and work as part of the crew on a deep space exploration vessel. And given that this is our first video, I thought I'd just go over some of our motivations behind the project and uh, what our long-term goals are for the game. Now, for many years now, I've been a big fan of both engineering, uh, architecture, and indeed spaceships. And when it came to designing uh, a game of this nature, from the outset I was keen to make it as realistic as possible, to the point where I was quite insistent that we start from the, the very literal steel framework of the spacecraft. Um, and in fact I've been very much inspired by watching what SpaceX are doing in Boca Chica, building their Starship program. And I wanted to approach this in the same way, so we prototype the, the framework and the structure and, and we try and build the ship in a way that makes the most sense from an engineering perspective. And so you can see here that we have every aspect of the physical structure modeled out here. Obviously this, is, this piece is a work in progress. But through these girders we'll have holes rooted for things like uh, the cables, the pipework and the various bits of machinery that help uh, make this into a workable space vessel. Now the area we're in at the moment is what will be the, uh, the main cruise mess hall. And you can see here this, this big cavernous space is uh, the part of the ship that hasn't yet been uh, really fleshed out very much. But this will contain things like the Arboretum, the shuttle bay, uh, the main engines, and all the big stuff pretty much. So if we head on into the, uh, the actual center of the ship, I just switch to third person. Some of this may look a little bit odd because it's still under construction. So right now we're on D-Deck and D-Deck is one of the main habitation levels. Um, split between D-Deck and E-Deck above there are 300 of these crew quarters and they will be for all of the enlisted crew. And as you can see it's a, a series of concentric rings um, each of which are lined by the crew quarters themselves. The, the, the E and the D decks are, are basically a self-contained city aboard the ship and they will contain everything that the crew needs to live a comfortable life in space given that this ship is designed for, for long-term space exploration. And again as I go around the corridors here you can see that the the steel framework is visible where I haven't yet um, added all the wall panels in and these holes here are going to be for all the, the cables and things which supply power to the lights and, and data so that we can turn the lights on and off and change colors and things and all of that will work in real time and will be uh, a large interconnected system um, so for example if one of these cables were to break it might actually turn all of these lights off down the rest of the corridor and that will form part of the engineer gameplay um, and not just the engineer but there will also be a number of other roles that the player can perform everywhere from the chef to a scientist, a medical officer all the way up to the captain. So if I just work my way towards the centre of the ship I'll try not to get lost So again, lots of this is still a work in progress, so these will be proper stairs when they're finished. Uh, so this is E-Deck, um, very similar to D-Deck below, it's going to consist um, pretty much entirely of crew quarters, and along with all the support and infrastructure that they need. Moving on up to C-Deck, C-Deck is going to be the main uh, science deck, so here you'll have all the science labs and all the various science disciplines. And up here we have B deck, which is the main administrative level. So I just jog around the corner here. So here we have the administration office. And again, it's very much a work in progress, but this will be where um, you have meeting rooms and, and HR and that kind of thing. Also up on B deck, you have the VIP. Uh, officers quarters essentially, the staterooms. 
Um, these are a more luxurious form of crew quarters, and these are the only ones that have physical windows looking out into space. They'll have a, a small kitchen area here when it's finished, uh, a comfortable lounge area, and a separate bedroom and ensuite bathroom. Again, it's, uh, it's just blocking out at this stage, getting a feel for the size of the rooms. And it's worth noting, actually, from a design perspective, um, we've designed the crew quarters so that they are individual modular units that are prefabricated in the factory. And the idea is that they are installed into the ship during its construction progress process even. And on the outside of the crew quarters will be a hookup for things like data, power, plumbing, that kind of thing. They'll also have their own independent uh, limited oxygen supply and will be airtight so the crew can use their quarters uh, as a lifeboat if necessary, or at least a, a place of safety. Okay, if we move on round, I'll just take a, a quick nose down the lift shaft. So you can see here, um, that's currently six decks down. There's no lift access to the seventh deck, as that's the lower section of engineering. Okay, moving on into here, this is going to be the officer's lounge, a comfortable space for the senior staff to relax after they've had their shift. And you'll notice these donuts strewn all over the floor. Uh, and the reason for that is I've been experimenting with a system of having the internals of the ship react to things happening on the outside. So if we, for example, uh, have a weapons strike or we just run into an asteroid or something, then you can see that objects on the inside of the ship can get knocked off of shelves and you'll have plates and cups falling off of tables and things <clears throat> just to just to get a little bit more immersion on the ship and uh, speaking of tables these aren't actually the final tables they're just a, a bit of garden furniture for scale um, this will eventually be a bar serving drinks to the officers and uh, this will be a, a much more ornate staircase when it's finished we have a mezzanine here with what will be the captain's table, although I may make this into a, a, a lounge uh, type area with a, a sofa and a coffee table. So moving on up here we have the command deck and again we've got some bare, bare steel work here because it's still under construction. Starting on the right we have the conference room and opposite there we have the XO's office, the first officer's office. And then we have the captain's ready room. And opposite there, a bathroom, which, again, is still under construction. And now we move into the command centre itself, the bridge. The bridge is one of the, the more completed areas of the ship, although it still needs a fair bit of work in places, uh, namely along the back here and some sections of the ceiling. But if I just go through the individual stations, um, over here we've got the, or what will be, the engineering station for propulsion systems. Again, engineering for power systems. We'll have internal security over here, uh, damage control and uh, inter internal environmental support. And uh, at the front here, of course, we have the captain and first officer's chairs. And I've designed these so that the captain can choose uh, either side, that there's no set chair for the captain, depends on their preference, whether they're left or right handed, for example. Down here we have the science console, which I'll come back to, the nav console. On the opposite side we have the uh, tactical console and communications, and the front here we've got the home console, of course. And you'll notice that uh, following me on the floor there, or rather hovering above the floor, is the hologrammatic orrery map and this is being projected down by the projector on the ceiling and this is really the focal point of the bridge which is why the consoles themselves face inward because this is going to be the main information display um, what would traditionally be a view screen and here you'll be able to see information such as uh, what you have targeted where you are um, the status of the ship 
or all, all manner of various bits of information. And this is all going to be controlled from the command console here. Now right now it's just controlling the orrery map, but you'll be able to select different modes depending on what you need to see. So here you can see we can raise the map up and down, although I do need to make it a little bit darker. And then you can change the scale to see the full extent of the system that you happen to be in at the time. So of course, with this being a space exploration game, um, one of the key points is actually exploring space. And to that end, the ship is, is fully, um, fully flyable uh, in real time. So if I just press the helm buttons randomly here, you can see that we have full control over the ship. So despite it being well over 300 rooms, over seven decks, um, the ship is very much a, a real vessel that you can still fly around space. So let's, um, let's go and pick a location here. So if I switch to first person and have a look at this console. This is our, our first iteration of the UNOS interface uh, and that stands for United Nations Operating System. And this is going to be a, a consistent design across all panels on the ship. And right now it just shows the, the targets that are in its current sensor range and you'll be able to change these using these buttons here which aren't actually enabled yet. But if we just uh, target bars for example hop on over here to the helm and engage the warp drive we should see Mars looming large so the planets themselves are, are one to one scale so this is a, a true scale Mars that we're looking at here and I'm keen to have true scale everything in the game so to really appreciate how big space is um, the game is very much focused on realism uh, and the real science behind space exploration uh, which is why here for example you can see the various zones around our sun so you have the habitable zone here for example and the frost line beyond and if you go over to this console again the way the the gameplay loop is going to work in terms of space exploration is if we just hit this button here you can see that we can randomly select all manner of different stars and in the game proper um, there will be a, a proper way of navigating through space but for now we can just randomly select star systems from a pool of over two billion and they're all completely unique so if we just pick, let's pick a, not an M class, there we go, a G class. So we perform a long range scan of that star. And we can see that there are seven signals. So that will correspond to, to seven orbiting bodies. So we lock the FTL target. And that will now allow the helm to then engage the FTL. So we just kind of try not to crash into Mars. And in just a few moments we will arrive at our destination. Again in the game proper um, it will probably have it so each light year travelled is a full day's work on the ship. So you'll get up in your crew quarters and perform your day's duties and that will be one light year travelled in space. As you can see there the sun is nice and bright and the, the surface detail of the star is completely procedurally generated and again there are over two billion possible combinations. So now that we're at this star system the next thing we want to do is see what's actually here so we'll do another scan of the local system. So there's a few interesting targets there. Now the important thing to note is that the the region around the star is being calculated based on actual physics. So it takes the Kelvin value of the star and its luminosity in order to generate the, uh, the various zones. So the habitable zone here, the frost line beyond, 
and it uses that information to generate which type of planets will appear in those regions. So the planets themselves um, could be anywhere within the system, but depending on their location, it will use their distance from the sun, or the star, and their luminosity, uh, or their albedo rather, and their atmospheric density to work out what their surface temperature or equilibrium temperature would actually be. And it uses all of that data to formulate what type of planet it would be. So here, for example, you can see um, a lava planet here in close orbit to the star. And in fact, let's go and have a look at that one. So if we just target the lava planet there, it's only 0.1 AU away from its star. full view. And there we have our, our lava planet. You can't really tell from this far away but the lava is actually moving on the surface. And we've got some what looks like clouds there as well. Again this is completely procedurally generated um, and again over two billion possible combinations. So if we have another look here. So we've also got their planet B. It's a rocky planet just skirting the outside of the habitable zone. So it's worth looking at that one just to see if it's an Earth-like. Uh, was it? it was B, wasn't it? Okay, so let's have a look at that one. See if we get an Earth like. Yeah, no, looks like it's too cold. So you can see that the atmosphere definitely isn't oxygen rich. Um, looks like it's possibly a methane atmosphere. And it's a frozen ball. So not one that will support life. And um, it's important to note that the plans for the game is that. The, the universe will be full of life, so if you find a, a potentially habitable planet it could have life on there ranging from simple bacterial uh, life with microbes all the way up to complex life uh, and indeed advanced civilizations. And in fact those civilizations could be millions of years more advanced than you. And you won't know until approaching them whether they are friendly or hostile or neutral so depending on the on the roll of the dice you could find perhaps an incredibly hostile race which are relatively primitive and, and so uh, pose no threat at all um, or you could find uh, a race which is incredibly hostile and, and technologically far in advance of you and your only recourse is to run as fast as you can um, but the game is going to be all about those, those first contact scenarios and, and discovering these worlds with interesting life forms. So while we're at this system, let's just have a look at the class 1 class giant. The class 1s are generally the prettiest, very much like Jupiter. And uh, I'll get a bit closer to this one so we can have a look. That's a strange one. Again, the, um, the planet's completely procedural and um, has a lot of, uh, of moving cloud layers that you can't quite see from this far away, so we'll get a bit closer. Just lower our orbit. Right now this is all happening very quickly. Um, the, the actual completed system for navigating in orbit will rely on uh, targeting certain locations within the planet's orbit, warping to those locations and then traveling around at sublight speeds. It's a very very cloudy one this, you can't hardly make out any detail. But you'll be able to scan them and take a look at the, the makeup of the planet's atmosphere and whether or not it contains life or indeed in useful chemicals because 
part of the gameplay will also be maintaining the ship and it will need fuel uh, during its travels and that's going to involve either scooping gases from certain locations or mining asteroids. Okay, let's have a look at another star system. Let's go for a M class. So the M class stars are the red dwarfs. They're um, usually the least interesting to look at. Although because they're they're a deep red colour, they're um, the nicest up close. Definitely my favourite kind of star. Although, in terms of what you generally find around them, um, it's very rare to find a habitable world simply because the temperature is so low like in this one they're, they're all just ice planets but we'll go and have a look at one anyway so there we can see the ice planet and all the cracked sheets of ice again all procedurally generated and, and the interesting thing here is that the the light that the star is emitting um, is its true Kelvin value and I imagine the the true color of the planet's surface is probably a shade of blue looking at it it has a, a bit of a green tinge to it so when you combine the the, the, the bluish or probably kind of aqua colour with the uh, orange light you get this interesting green but all the right, all the lighting um, is properly calculated so what you see is what it should look like in real life okay so there's a, a brief overview of what the game's all about Again, as the development continues, we'll release more videos discussing all of the various tools and systems in more detail. But hopefully that was a, a good taster as to what to expect in the future. Um, if you love the project, then, then please do support it. And if you want to try it out yourself, we are currently operating an early access program for our Patreons and our PayPal donators. Um, we'll provide details for this in the description below. Thanks for watching and hopefully we should expect to see more soon.